Thank you. So why am I here today? Um, I want to talk to you about um, some, let me just say this, some thinking. I wouldn't put it much stronger than that. Some thinking and some writing I've been doing the last uh, three or four months. And uh, I've given it a title called A New Model for Testing, which is kind of an aggressive kind of title. Because you think, well, wait a minute. Is this guy going to tell us it's all wrong and we're all going to change the way we work for, for now and forever? I don't know. It's an aggressive title, but it's there to get some attention. So uh, bear with me. I don't, I don't take me too seriously. But if I just called it yet another way of thinking about testing, no one would have paid attention to it. So I want, to, I want to make some suggestions about the way we test and have tested in the past. And uh, it may or may not, I think not, work as well in the future. I want to talk a little bit about the concept of models and how testers use them. And I haven't got enough time to talk about any of these topics. But um, I want to sort of introduce you to the idea of models if you don't already know them inside out. Um, if you don't think you use models, well, I'm telling you, you do already if you're a tester. We all do. So I want to talk about models, and then describe the model itself. You know, this, uh, you know, grandiose uh, vision of the way we should all be thinking, you know, uh, for, for forever now. What the hell? I want to focus on on the outcome of thinking this way. So the model is just a way of uh, presenting and simplifying what we do as testers. Okay. And uh, what's his name? Uh, George Box said ages ago, all models are wrong, some are useful. You get the idea. It's just a way of thinking about what we do. And I want to suggest that most of what we do actually, actually is thinking. So it's a little bit convoluted, this. I'm going to talk about models, test models. I'm going to talk about models of testing, models of testing that describe the way we use models in testing. It's all a bit, you'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. And I want to make some suggestions about skills. I think there are some interesting opportunities uh, with the model. Uh, in particular, I want to focus on skills, which is probably the most significant thing, I have to say. And do a little bit of what next, next and make some observations about how I think the testing market is changing. And some of these things I've been saying for a year or two. Uh, some of these things I'm beginning to see. Some of these things are actually, I'm meeting people who say, well, we've always worked that way. They've never worked the old way, whatever the hell that was. So. Uh, that's kind of the, 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 the agenda for the next uh, 40 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. So um, I don't know how familiar you are and how many of you are looking for jobs at the moment, but if you browse the job ads for testers, you might get something like this pop up. Now, I'm not going to read it all out, but you can just pick a few keywords off, off, off the page. Uh, Thoroughly sharp, good.net, experience building, maintaining automation, test automation, ability to interact with developers. Ooh. Ability to influence, uh, good test procedures are developed and implemented. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but in the context of the more technical uh, skills that are there. But the notion of this job seems to be very technical focused. You know, some knowledge of Java, an interest in photography. So is that a job familiar to anybody in the room? Anyone, is anyone doing this job? I mean, but is it not the case that you see more and more more technically oriented job specs for testers. The world does seem to be shifting left, bringing embedding testers in this. So I want to drop some big hints about what I think is happening in the market and make some suggestions. And if it's happening to you or happened to you, uh, good luck. If it's not happened yet, keep your eyes open. It might be coming your way. It's actually a, a job uh, relating to wearable computing. Okay, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, that kind of stuff. Is anyone working in the Internet of Everything? Can I ask anyone getting into that space yet? Oh, two or three? I think there's a, OK, three, maybe, maybe four. OK, good. I think there'll be a lot more in the future, OK? It's, we're really at the toe end of something very, very big. But anyway, here's, here's kind of where I think uh, the world is at, according to Paul. Um, and I know you guys, because uh, you know, test and verification, you know, the company is in a different space than I normally work. So I know a lot of you guys are not going to be working in the space I'm working. I'm kind of middle of the road IT, mostly. Mostly. I do know a bit about uh, the more higher integrity uh, world and uh, hardware testing and stuff like that. A bit, but I'm no expert. That's not really my expert of expertise. This is what's happening in the middle of the road world. Okay? It may or may not affect you. And this is what I want to suggest is something to think about. So there is a stampede to mobiles. I mean, you know, Mobile computing is absolutely everywhere. It's, it's, it's either the next big thing, or it is, it is the big thing now. But it's not going to stop. 
Okay. What we call mobile computers now are things we carry, but anything that moves is going to be connected in some way. So our cars, obviously, are going to go in that direction. I'm told that a lot of the cars that are being sold right now have the capability to be part of the Internet of Things, but they haven't been activated yet. I don't know if that's true or not. That was told me in a pub. In fact, I get most of my information in pubs, I have to say. So the Internet of Everything and pervasive computing, wearable computing, uh, some of you, I'm sure, are more sporty than me and, and wear you know, Fitbits or whatever you call them, these little uh, devices on your wrist. That's just the beginning. Okay? We're going to see more and more of that stuff. Uh, continuous delivery and DevOps. Is anyone involved in continuous delivery? Anyone doing some of that? Okay, one down the front, a couple maybe at the back. Okay. Uh, test analytics. Anyone doing test analytics? Capturing data in production and using that to influence the, behavior, uh, the uh, decisions to make changes in production. You know, doing that sort of thing? Oh, cool. Okay, two, three. Okay. Uh, Microsoft have got this phrase called data-driven development, which they are now choosing to, as a little bit buzzword, I don't know how public it is yet, but they're using that to label, to reference this notion of using data from production, analytics, to drive development. So almost like, they're almost sort of saying, well, let's not have BAs, let's not do analysis, let's just listen to our customers as how they're using the product and use the data captured there to influence what we do in the future. I think we're still, it's still a bit more hype than, than reality, but whatever. Uh, shift left, embedded testers, no test team at all. Has anyone, has anyone been shifted left? <laughs> okay, test, it, test early in the life cycle, you know, that's been test, test early, test often, that's all it is. There's nothing new in this. In fact, there's nothing new in anything I'm going to say. So this new model is a bit of a scam, I have to say. Okay. So I want to suggest, and I want to do this really quick. I'm really sorry. This is I just I dropped this in this morning. Um, um, I had an idea about describing the real world that's out there is not just agile versus structured or waterfall. Continuous delivery, I think, is not agile, and it's not structured. It's a third way. Okay? Now I'm not, not suggesting this is the way the world is going to look for everybody, because everybody I've ever met has said, "Well, we're mostly agile with a bit of structured." Oh yeah, we do we do do weekly releases. That kind of game. Everyone is doing some kind of hybrid. So there is no one way. And these little labels are just to suggest that there are, par there are commonalities between these different, different approaches. So here are my, here's my suggestion. There are, three, there are three ways. Except there aren't three ways. There aren't three patterns. Everyone is doing some kind of hybrid. Now if that's the case, every textbook you read on one of those three approaches, let's say, is wrong. And it doesn't suit the way you work because you can't be fit. You can't fit into one of those patterns. So the world is going hybrid, not agile. And agile is transient. Agile is just a, just a perspective. It's not an approach, I don't think. And I'll probably get into trouble with you know, the agilists who say I'm being uh, backward looking or whatever. But I think the agilists are now kind of passe now, aren't they? It's not fashionable to be agile anymore. I don't think agile is fashionable anymore. It's kind of, we've moved on a little bit. Agile with a little a is critical. Agile with a big A following process at passe. Okay, that's my own. Now, if there aren't three patterns and the world has to behave, you know, the, the software development world has to behave in a, in a kind of a hybrid pattern, I want to suggest that the, the way we think about testing, whether it is putting a bum on a seat in an agile team and just doing what the hell you can to get, to get by, or being part of a larger team working with uh, uh, large-scale requirements, test documentation, dum -de dum dum all that heavy process, you know, certified way of looking at things. I don't think these things will work. Not if we're going to get into more rapid iterations, faster turnarounds of, of requirements through to delivery. We're going to be using data in production to drive our behavior as software development organizations. and so on and so forth. You know, we're just going to be a hybrid. So we just have to be pure. We, have, we really do have to be agile. That is, we need to be able to react to anything. And anything might be a three-year timetable for software delivery or a three-day timetable for software delivery. We have to be able to react to both. Now, how the hell do we do that if we don't know these things are coming ahead of time? So I want to just take a little aside, and I'm sure some of you, because, if you, work, because you work in kind of the more higher integrity arena, let's call it, know all about models already. So I'm going to bore some of you with this, but I'm going to say this, make this statement. All testing is based on models. 
And in order to illustrate what a model is, I just want to show you some examples, okay? So this is when, um, uh, I have got prizes actually, I've got little books I give away. I'll give a prize away for one, I think there might be a, a physicist in the room here. So what's that? You recognize that? Anyone recognize that? Sir, so, oi, don't be facetious. I know, it's, I know it's out of focus and uh, it's probably too early in the day to, you don't recognize that shape? Sequence diagram, thank you very much, no price for that, that's easy. What's that? I can't remember what Microsoft Project call it now, it's kind of a Gantt chart, it's a, it's a dependency chart, isn't it, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, what's that? It's a class diagram, isn't it? It looks like entity relationship, but actually you've got uh, oops, uh, attributes and you've got methods, uh, you know, feature, uh, functions. Okay. What's that? It's a weather, come on, I mean, you don't all have to shout at once, but it's a weather map, isn't it? Okay. It's a forecast based on a mathematical model, which some super cube, some, some supercomputer, someone on the planet uh, processes, takes data, readings from uh, measurements all over the planet, or all over your region, uh, does a ton of processing and generates a picture like that, and then makes a prediction that is only 70, is it 70% chance of being correct the day after? Pretty bloody appalling, I think. Didn't, uh, did you see that news item a few weeks ago? Uh, we're paying, uh, we, I say we, you know, the government are paying, is it 70 million or 100 million pounds for a computer that's only going to be 70% accurate the day after? That's how good we are at this. Maybe they're using crap models or maybe computing isn't the answer. I don't know, whatever. But it's a model, okay? It's based on a model. Does anyone recognize that? I will give a prize for this. No physicists. I win this every time. This is excellent. I like it. Um, this is, uh, oh God, what's his name? Paul Dirac's equation of the electron behaving as a wave. From the most fantastic piece of mathematical genius, you know, like, you know, Einstein. He's up there with Einstein, okay, and Maxwell, those guys. You know, really, really up there in terms of elegance and sophistication and value and, and accuracy. But it's a model. It's a model of the electron. That's all it is. Who said circle line? <laughs> okay, it's a model. Is it accurate? If you overlaid it on an OS map, is it accurate? Of course it is not. But is it useful? Yes. It simplifies a very complex you know, underground network to make it usable by us, but mostly tourists, who still struggle. But Okay, uh, last one. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, haven't got, I haven't got all day. It's a block on a slope with friction, isn't it? Okay, anyone do A-level maths and resolving the forces? And this thing here, this thing here is a vector diagram. It's a model. I mean, how many years ago was this? Do we care? I don't care. Okay, it's a model, all right? And it kind of works for most of the engineering things we use. But it's a simplification. Obviously it is. It might have worked for pushing a block of stone up towards the top of a pyramid. But it would have worked, okay? Anyway, all these things are models. Now, the thing about models is, uh, you know, do we have to be uh, physicists or weathermen or mathematicians or whatever to use models? Certainly not. I want to suggest this, that suppose this is me, handsome fellow with always a complete head of hair. Um, I know I've got a cup of water over there, okay? And I'm thirsty, and I'm going to think, well, I need to walk about seven or eight paces to get over there to pick up the water. How the hell am I going to do that? I need to look at my surroundings and model the environment. I need to model the fact there's a step here I could fall off quite easily, and I have done in the past, okay? I need to, I need to look or think about all the configuration of all the bones in my body and all the muscles that control them. And know that starting state before I take a single step. And in making a step, I need to send all these nerve impulses to, to the right muscles to get walking. And every time I take a step, my brain calculates and calibrates and recalculates and recalibrates the model it's made of my world. So that I can actually walk a few paces. I even left the ground then and get a drink. I'm going to put the drink over here. So all I'm trying to say is models are absolutely part of the makeup of human beings. We use models all the damn time. What we've got between our ears is the most fantastic machine for manipulating really, really sophisticated models. We just don't call it that. Okay? Now, 
I want to talk about a new model, a new way of thinking about testing. And it's not, some of you will say, oh, this isn't new. Good. It means I'm not far off. I'm taking that as a compliment if someone says, well, none of that's new. I think, fantastic. Fantastic. If he said, none of that is right, I'd be worried. It's a work in progress. It might be, might take me to my grave, this dumb thing. But my first statement, I want to make a couple of statements and then get into it. All testing is exploratory. Okay? Does anyone do exploratory testing here? Okay? But you do it according to the way it's been presented out there. I'm going to change the definition slightly, and you'll understand in a moment. But all people who test explore. What we do is we explore sources of knowledge. Now, a source of knowledge might be a requirement, a design. It might be our experience, our knowledge, our intuition. It might be the system itself. We explore our sources of knowledge. And what we do is, in order to understand the complexity of the problem we're trying to grasp, to understand, okay, we build mental models. We might write them down. We might have models given to us. Okay, fantastic. More often, we build mental models to understand, to simplify the complexity of the systems we test. And from those models, we use those models to inform our testing. So a model doesn't tell us what to test. It gives us something to work out what would be a good thing to, to cover. Okay? So if I showed you a tube map and said, here's a model of our system, and I crossed out London Underground and called it Pass Through the Business Process or Pass Through the Real-Time Management Process of an Operating System or whatever, you could say, aha, if that model's correct, what can I do? I can count things. I can count stations and cover them in my test. I can trace paths through the different colored lines and string them end to end as end to end tests. And I can count the links between blobs on the diagram. In fact, any picture I showed you that was a model with blobs and lines, a good tester would say, life is easy. I just need to count the blobs, count the lines, cover the whole lot, trace paths. And I, I've even got things like uh, state transition testing is based on that. And there's Chow's coverage, and there's zero switch, and one switch, and two switch, and all that kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with that. That would all work. Because a state transition model, a state model, is a model. A tube map is a model. Things in our heads that we never commit to paper are models. Okay? So, now, in order for this to be meaningful, this exercise of thinking about the way we think, we have to get rid of all the garbage out of our minds, all the clutter. And I'm going to call that logistics, all this clutter. So. What's in my mind that gets in the way of me thinking about testing? Well, the first thing is documentation. Let's pretend documentation doesn't exist, okay? That I don't need to communicate. Let's pretend, okay? Let's forget documentation. Let's, pre let's forget whether we use a tool or we do testing by hand. Let's forget that, because that doesn't affect the thinking about the test. Let's forget whether we're in an agile team or waterfall or structured. That's got nothing to do with the way I think about testing in the here and now. Okay? Uh, plan versus exploratory, as you would recognize it today. Don't care. Okay? Let's forget that. Let's forget plans. I'm just looking at a source of knowledge and considering what I would use as good tests right here, right now. Do I care what technology it is? No, I don't. Okay? So let us consider testing without all this crap removed. Okay? A lot of it is not crap. We've got to do some of this stuff. I understand. But that's a distraction from the thought process of testers. So uh, here's, here's the kind of the picture. Okay? This, is the, this is the high level, the helicopter view of the model, if you like. With this little strap line, explore source of knowledge, build models that inform our test. We do some exploration. Okay? And we create models. So we have this process on the left, which is exploring information, interviewing people, reading documents, studying designs, whatever it is, thinking about what we know and how it relates to what we have to test. And we build models. And at some point, we think, you know what? I know enough to create a test. I think I understand what this system's about, or this little routine, or this line of code. Don't care. That's logistics. I think I know enough to create a test. And then I flip over from exploring to testing, at which point I select the test case. I might put some data into a table. I might just think it and type it. I don't care. 
but we do some testing. And occasionally what we find is our tests, our testing reveals stuff about the system that we didn't, we hadn't thought about, which demonstrates to us that maybe our model, ah, oh, I didn't expect that. My understanding is wrong. So we have this kind of loop where we explore, we test, and when we test, we may discover our models aren't good enough. And eventually we get there, of course, we end up with good models, I guess. But we can't guarantee that we know everything we need to know about the system to test before we've almost done some testing, if you like. So we have this, these two modes of thinking. And what I'm going to do, oh, one last thing, what determines when we transition from exploration to test? I don't know. It's a piece of judgment. It's woolly thinking. Not woolly thinking, but thinking, I can't describe it. We just kind of know, don't we? Now, maybe some smart person can figure out what goes in that green blob. But there's this notion of judgment, okay, which says, I think I know enough to test. Or, I don't think I know enough to test. And we have all been there. Okay? But I don't think we can articulate what that is. Uh, any developers in the room? Any ex-developers? Uh, I think developers think the same way. Developers build models just the same as testers do. I'm not convinced of this yet. I don't think this is, represents development thinking processes, but when a, when a developer starts testing, I think it does. So I'm going to look at the left-hand blue blob in a bit more detail. I've got some sources of knowledge, okay? Documents, my knowledge, the system itself. And I do some exploration. And by that, I inquire. I ask questions, okay? So I might interview someone and ask questions. I might read a piece of paper. I might think back to an experience I've had in the past. I explore my sources of knowledge. And as I do that, I build mental models. Maybe I write them down. Maybe not. I don't care. That's logistics. But I, I end up with some concept of a test model. And once I've got a test model in my head, I can use that test model to make predictions. So if, if the way the system works is this, then I could say, well, what if A and B and C, then what happens to B? I can make a prediction. So I can use that prediction to actually challenge my source. So when I, I interview a user and say, what should the system do? And he says, A, B, C. And you go away and you think, oh, wait a minute. If A, B, and C, well, what about D? Let me go and ask him about D. And you say, well, if A, B, and C, then what about D? And then the user says, what? Oh, I never thought of that. Or, oh, shit, you better stop. I have a rethink. Because that changes the whole philosophy of my thinking of the requirements. Or they say, quite right, we should just add it to the requirements catalog. Well done, Mr. Tester. All sorts of outcomes. We've all been there and we've all seen them. But we have this kind of cycle going on. That's the left-hand side. So suppose we've got a model. Now I'm looking at the right-hand side. Input to the right-hand side. Okay? What do I do? My model informs my testing. So like, as an example, a flowchart would be something, it's a model. I could trace paths in a flowchart. The flowchart doesn't tell me what to test, but I can use that model to inform my thinking about what is a good thing to test. And then I can apply the test. Now, be very careful uh, what I'm saying here. I don't care whether you apply this test by hand, tap, 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 or using t test automation, or you do it through the Vulcan mind meld. I don't care, because that's logistics. And when we apply that test, applying includes checking the outcome. Okay? So when I apply a test, I get a result. And if I've got a prepared expectation, which I should have because I've got a model, okay, um, I can say, oh, pass-fail. What does pass-fail mean? Possibly nothing, right? Possibly everything. That outcome of applying the test needs a human to interpret. This is done by humans or tools or ESP don't care. This can only be done by people. So interpretation of a result, a pass, isn't automatically success. A pass might be, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Now, just to keep you comfortable that we're not completely out in outer space and uh, not thinking about the real world, uh, some tests will result, you might log an outcome that is a failure, revise a system, retest, and off you go. Okay? Whatever. What the hell? I'm not interested in that bit. That's logistics. I know it's critical, but it's logistics. So, okay, I do some reporting. That is critical. I need 
to tell someone about what I've just done or act on what I've just learned. But sometimes when I run my tests, my interpretation tells me, you know what, our models aren't good enough. We don't know enough about the system to apply good tests yet. So we have this kind of return loop of refining the model. And we might actually go back, have to go back and uh, do some more exploring. Who knows? Let's go back to the requirements. What do the requirements say? Seven months after you've last looked at them. And this is the whole picture end to end. So it looks like some kind of crawling insect, I know. And that wasn't intentional, it just, just came out that way. All right? There were three or four iterations of this, and they all look like blobs and lines, okay? Model. Um, and that's how it ended up, okay? So I've given you like a, the whistle-stop tour of the thinking behind this. But essentially, what I'm trying to suggest is these words, inquiring, modeling, reforming, reporting, applying, interpreting, logging, refining, predicting, challenging. These are the activities that we do either in our heads or maybe in collaboration with other people. No mention of logistics. Okay? If you're interested in reading the background to this, there's a paper down here. I didn't get my slides to you know, the TMV guys in time, I'm afraid, so it's not in the handouts. But um, go and talk to me, I'll give you the reference and the whatever, but it's devsb.qa slash download is good enough. You can find the link to the new model. So there's a paper behind all this, about 30 pages. It's quite substantial. Now, that model is completely useless until we find a use for it. Okay? So what could we possibly use this for? How could this possibly help us to think about what we do as testers? So I want to suggest that, so I'm, I'm arguing, I say tentatively, but actually, if you get in an argument with me, I tend to be quite aggressive about these things. I think it aligns with the way we do testing in any project. Agile, structured, waterfall, continuous, I don't care. Developer testing, system, acceptance, user testing. It might, it might be appropriate for testing anything as well, not just software. That's a huge statement to make. But if, depending on what your goal is, it might help you, depending on what you, want to achieve, what you want to achieve. So whatever your context, it might have value. I certainly think it aligns with the TDD, BDD, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? It sits really quite nicely with that. Because a story is a model. Uh, it aligns with, the, I think, the context-driven view. Some of them argue, because they're just argumentative. Some of them agree. Okay? I've met both sides. I don't care too strongly, um, but you know, they have views and we should pay, pay respect to them. Um, I think it possibly works for non-functional as well as functional. So I've talked really about functional. Uh, some non-functional uh, tests like performance, it fits fine. Usability, I don't know. I'm not so sure. It's a different perspective on the testing versus checking kind of debate. There's no debate now. I think it's, these terms are used by some people. Um, I, I, it gives a different perspective. I don't see value in this testing versus checking. If a test is simply, if, if a check is simply a test that could be run by a tool, fine. But so what? Um, I think it fits the way that uh, developers test. I think it fits this idea of embedded or shift left as well. It, it sits comfortably. I should say I'm not really a tester. I'm a developer. Um, I think it gives you a, a different perspective on test automation. The reason we fail at test automation so often is because we take manually manual tests and reverse engineer them into test automation. Ask a developer, you know, would he rather work with some code and reverse engineer it, or would he rather see the model that is attempted to be uh, covered in a test? We should build test automation from models. We should always intend to automate, not think we'll create some manual tests and then auto automate them. That's kind of, I'm beginning to say to people now, I think that's insane. It is insane, it's crazy. I think there's a big overlap with uh, the way we think about skills, capabilities, and certification. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. Capabilities. So, you remember the ing words? I think there's 10 of them. One, two, three, four, yeah, 10. Okay? We'll talk about those briefly. If you look at each one of those in turn, and I've not, this isn't the most in-depth analysis you've ever seen. I've not spent years doing this. I've probably spent an afternoon. Okay? I came up, uh, I'll come to that in a second. I want to suggest the new model uh, makes implications about the skills that we should teach testers, that we, the skills that we should try and refine as testers. Okay? Understanding entry and exit criteria, um, 
raising in incident reports, whatever, that's all great stuff, yeah. But that doesn't make me a better tester, that's just admin, isn't it? What makes me a great tester is getting to the heart of the problem we want to solve, understanding the systems we have and what they're capable of and what they are not capable of. That is at the heart of testing. So I want to suggest that the ideas that come out of the, 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 the uh, skills, capabilities, call them what you like, that come out of this way of thinking are quite different from what you see in the certification schemes. And we'll have a look. Oh, I did, did the last bullet. More important than any technical skill is interpersonal skills. With charm, you can do anything. That sometimes gets a laugh, but never mind. I'm obviously in a room of techies. Are we all autistic in here? Are we all rationals? There's a, there's a, there is <laughs> there's a predominance in the industry. There's probably a lot in this room. Whew. God, how to, how to not get out alive. Um, so so the color, I made a list, a really informal off the top of my head list. I spent a, an hour or two. I didn't spend long on this at all. But I made a list of the sort of things I think would be relevant to someone who thinks about the core thought processes of testing. So there's stuff in here like uh, custom test design techniques. And I've picked, I'm picking these at random. I, please trust me, because I, I actually get a kick out of being, uh, what's the word? Improvisational, um, custom test design techniques. If I run a team with 10 people, I don't want to hear that they're all following a composition of boundary values every day. I want to hear about five brand new, unique, in the world, test design techniques every day from that team. That's what I want. That's how it should be. The techniques that we teach by rote in the certification schemes are a tiny, tiny microscopic subset of what is possible because we've got this fantastic machine up here. We don't use it. Ten new test design techniques a day. All right, maybe a week. Okay. Why not? Um, one more. One at random. I like this one. Socratic method. Why should we teach Socratic method to testers? Because when we explore a source of knowledge and we think, you know what, these requirements aren't sound. How do you get your user, your BA or whoever, to pay attention? You ask them a question about the requirement, saying, well, suppose this and this and this happens. You give them an example, and, they, and it's an example. They can't deny it. You know, their requirement should cover all eventualities, potentially. And you give them an example that you know is inconsistent. You know the answer. The Socratic method is about asking questions for which you already know the answer, because you're trying to, you could say, manipulate people, or you could say trying to inform people about their lack of knowledge, and their communal, their joint, their project-wide lack of knowledge. That's why Socratic method is so important. Is that appearing on anybody's uh, certification scheme? So I kind of sketched out this picture of how you might think of some kind of framework of skills. Now I'm probably spending most of my time up here, although this morning I was testing wireless networks. So I'm in my jeans and I'm a bit, I'm a bit grubby because I was testing wireless networks in a mock-up of a uh, branch for a large bank will not be named. So the stuff I'm going to talk about in terms of the model, the model is down here. Okay? So it's all kind of deep techy stuff. Okay? And you might pay attention to that, you might not care about it and where you are in, in your in your world or your career. What I'm trying to say is the framework, that framework doesn't look anything like any of the certification schemes. I think you could map the skills in here to certification schemes, I think. If you go to certification, certification schemes and look for any of that stuff, you will not find any. So I'm not having a go at the certification schemes, although it sounds like I am. What I'm trying to suggest is that certification schemes are great for what they are. They are purely about logistics. They are not about testing. Now, I never figured that out until I put the model together. And that was an insight to me. It made me think, now I understand why we're always arguing about for or against certification. Now, my good friend Susan Windsor uh, has said, well, that's all very well, Paul, but I'm really more interested in interpersonal skills. So she's beginning to put together something that looks a bit more like an inter interpersonal skills framework. She doesn't actually call it that. She calls it uh, people skills, but what the, what, what the hell? It's kind of, and, th and these are probably more important. Okay, technical skills are good, but if you have charm, you can get anyone to do anything for you. Okay, isn't that how the world really works? But as rationals, we can't believe that. Okay, what can we do with this? 
Um, could we come up with a broader test of skills framework? I, I think there's something in this. I think I'd like to have a go. So I'm talking to two or three people about doing just that. Uh, putting it on the web, making it open. Anyone can take it, take it or leave it, do what you like with it. Um, a competitive certification scheme, I don't think there's any point. Because I'm not interested in logistics. That's what consultants do. Practitioners focus on the thinking. Okay? It aligns, I think, with BD, ADD, da, 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 I don't care whether. It kind of aligns with these things. I, I kind of started with BDD and almost worked backwards to look to create the model. Um, and I think we, it gives us some flexibility, which we don't get any other way. So I need to move on. So what next? I mean, where I'm at with this is it needs a better explanation. Okay? So I've crashed through it in about half an hour. Okay? Um, I think there's a lot more to it than I've said, obviously. And I need to write that stuff down. I've written about half of it. I think what I've got as a paper is only half the story. There's a lot more to do, I have to say. Uh, we need some examples and comparison with other, other stuff. And I want to just come full circle, if you like, and I want to come back to some of the things that inspired me to think, of, think this way and to think that this might be a useful thing to do. So I just want to make some observation. I honestly think that shift left, moving testers closer to development, embedding them in development, getting rid of test teams altogether, that kind of stuff, I think it's more important and significant than Agile, okay? Because it's not just the small teams working in an Agile world. It's for everybody. That's why I think we should pay attention to shift left. What else do I think? Um, this is one of those things that uh, too many testers think, yeah, developers write code, I test, and you know, us and them. Uh, all the us and them stuff where the developers throw it over the fence. I'm sorry, a lot of testers actually want that. And that's wrong. Okay? Testing doesn't just apply to existing software at the end. Okay? Uh, you will have been saying, you will have heard consultants say, you will have read in books and bit of conferences, we test, <laughs> we test uh, early, we test often. Okay? We test systems, not software. We should think about what we test as systems rather than a piece of code. Okay? There's more to life. Um, testers need to learn how to code. I'm not telling you to learn how to code. Some may have to. So pay attention to that. And I've written a little book on Python, but that's by the way. Um, I think this. I don't think testers own testing. I think testing is for everybody, but we are, we are testers with superpowers in our projects. We understand what goes on in our projects, and we use our knowledge to influence, to consult, to advise. Every now and then we get our hands dirty and do a bit of testing. But we're not there just to do the dirty work of developers. If we are seen, perceived to be uh, the people who clear up the mess of development, we'll be treated as their servants. I'm quite right. We need to move away from that. So uh, be a test master. Forget this scrum master rubbish. Test master, much more useful role. Uh, last slide. The phase of development is not testing. It is rework. Let's call the spade a spade. Suppose, speculate, and put that in a plan. In front of a project manager and say, I'm going to call this phase rework. What the hell do you do that for? Said, well, that's what happens. No, it's testing. No, no, no. I, I, create, I run tests, I learn stuff, no one pays attention to me. I run tests, I find a bug, maybe someone fixes it. Let's call the test phase rework. And then people's attitude to development and test will change dramatically. And I think developers could use the model too to understand what we do, and we can use it to explain what we do to get on better in our shifting left activity. And I'm done. I'm sorry for being late. Thanks very much indeed.